A model who was featured on the cover of European Vogue fell to a very public death on a Manhattan street. She appeared in advertisements and on runways for designers such as Marc Jacobs and DKNY. Руслана Коршунова была главным открытием Нью-Йоркской недели моды. Twenty-year-old Ruslana Korshunova fell from the ninth floor of her apartment in the financial district. People took photos and watched as police blocked off the scene. The case is still under investigation. First of all, jumping is a very unusual form of suicide. Very young and uh, successful. Today I want to talk about Ruslana Korshinova and Anastasia Drozdova. Both Ruslana and Anastasia were models. Both of them joined the same group or cult, whatever you want to call it. People call it a cult. It's a cult, okay? And uh, they both fell from buildings. Now, some people say they jumped. Other people say they were pushed. And then when it comes to the whole push thing, it was like, were they pushed physically or were they pushed mentally? So I want to do what I usually do on my channel, which is I want to give you guys the facts. We'll discuss the theories and then you can decide for yourself. I do want to thank the sponsor. This video is sponsored by Scentbird. Scentbird is a subscription service. You could get one or up to three sample sizes and they're not your typical sample sizes eight times the size of the typical sample you would get a month's worth of the fragrance so you can really tell how much you like it before you purchase the whole thing and it comes in this really cool packaging i've been watching fragrance videos in the fragrance community on youtube and i was spraying on my skin which like changes the chemistry so i'm gonna do it on the paper because i'm a professional now so I'm trying to upgrade Dirty Hino Hinoki. Ooh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. I can see the dirty, but it's not like what you would think. It's like herbaceous. It's herbaceous and woody. Look at me with the notes. This is Confessions of a Rebel. Bitch, please. <laughs> it's called Bitch, please. Okay, I love that. I've, I've tried this brand before from Scentbird, and I've liked what I've tried, so let's see. High hopes. Mmm. Oh, it's sweet. Mmm. Black currant, jasmine, sandalwood, and skin musk. And they have a really good promotion going on right now. It's 55% off. So instead of the usual 16 per month, it's only $7 a month. Use my code below. Thank you so much for sitting through that. And thank you to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Okay, so the whole thing started on June 28th, 2008. It was summer, it was a Saturday, it was in Manhattan in the financial district near Wall Street, and it was around 2.30 p.m. when witnesses all heard a loud thud. One witness said, I heard a thump. I thought a car had hit a person. I turned around, a girl was lying in the road. Another person said, I turned around just as she was about three feet off the ground and then boom, she hit. Another person said, all I saw was something moving out of the corner of my eye and then boom, it sounded like a bass drum when she hit the ground. I look down the street and I say to the cop, did that person just get hit by a car? Her arms were crushed, her head was on the left side and blood was coming out in a pool. She wasn't wearing any shoes, but she was wearing jeans and a purple tank top. They said that she basically died on impact uh, from blunt force trauma. So this person was Ruslana Korshinova, and she had fallen, jumped, been pushed. We don't know yet, but she fell from the ninth story of a building. And when she fell... A bunch of people were taking her picture. One person even said she, quote, looked beautiful, even lying in the street. Turns out that Ruslana was a well-known model at the time. She was known as 
the Russian Rapunzel because she had really long hair and she had these blue eyes, which she actually had like a medical condition. It was a defect, but it caused them to always shine. She was at an agency where Heidi Klum and Kate Moss were models and it was just four days before her 21st birthday. They ended up talking to her best friend at the time who had just spoken to her the night before for a long time and her name is Kira Titineva. Pretty sure I said that wrong, I'm so sorry. But Kira said, quote, we were talking on the phone last night. She loved life so much. She was an angel. She was my best friend. I talked to her Friday night and we were talking all the gossip. She wasn't wild. She was never on drugs or anything. There's no way she would have killed herself. She loved life so much. Another person said, quote, she really liked New York. People made her feel comfortable here. I'm still in shock. The world lost a great person. She was on top of the world. There were no signs. That's what's driving me crazy. I don't see one reason why she would do that. And that was a common theme with all of Ruslana's friends and loved ones, they were all like, there's no way she did this. There's, there's just no way. So of course an investigation began. And the first thing we found out was that there were photographs taken of her, the last photographs taken of her while she was alive. And it was the night before she fell from the building. And these are some of the photographs. The photographer's name is Eric Heck. And he said, quote, I shot her when she wasn't watching. She had no time to pose. That's when you get the best work. She was free. The building that she fell from was not actually the building she lived in. She lived in an apartment, which they went to. They found that the door was locked. They broke in and the first thing they noticed was that her apartment was super messy. Then they saw a knife in the balcony and when they looked out of the balcony they saw that there was this netting there and the netting had been cut there was no suicide note but they did find prescription pill bottles and the labels had russian writing on them so maybe she filled them in russia or something like that so once word got out that there were these pills and all this people started speculating and that's when the rumors started they were like she's a prostitute she's a drug addict uh, the russian mafia is involved it says here the Los Angeles Times wrote that the death of the Russian model might be connected with her desperate wish to break away from the hands of Paris, New York, Moscow mafia. The newspaper wrote that the mafia controls young models and makes them render escort services to wealthy individuals. And then another friend of hers said, quote, in Paris and Milan, there'd be these dinners. Rich men would pay to come. We could join in for free. Ruslana and I would go. It would be our only chance to eat. In addition to these escort rumors, there were also rumors that she went to a, a private island in the Caribbean owned by a certain someone that um, we all know this name. Jeffrey Epstein? Yeah, we'll get into it a little bit later. Ruslana also mentioned to some of her friends that she had sued an agent uh, for stealing like half a million dollars from her in fees. And so people were talking about, well, she had these money problems and a lawsuit, like maybe it was the agent. And then people were like, oh, well, the doorman could have done it. And then they went and interviewed the doorman. Very young and uh, successful. And the doorman said that she came home at 4 a.m. Remember, she felt it fell at 2.30 p.m. that day. So she was in the wee hours of the morning coming back home. And he said, quote, she came in this morning. She smiled, no sense of depression. She was a very sweet girl, always smiling, never depressed looking. I feel bad, he said. My heart is broken. She was beautiful, beautiful. Then people were talking about how she had like this stomach ache that she was talking about in the days leading up to her death. And that's when people started bringing up her ex-boyfriend because when she came home at 4 a.m., she was spending the evening with her ex-boyfriend, Artem Perchenok. Okay. Yes, I said that wrong. For sure. So he said that she, he dropped her off at 5 a.m. The doorman said she got there at 4 a.m. So sometime maybe between 4 and 5 a.m. she comes home. So according to Artem, he said uh, that they were watching the movie Ghosts. You know, the one with Demi Moore? 
Yes, they were watching that movie. He said she was a good person. And he also said it was a slip and fall. That's what we all want to believe. But then he added that she was doing great in her career. However, maybe she was overworked. He said it was taking off. She was busy, busy. When you're 20 years old and you travel the world, how can you complain? But your family's back home and people are telling you what to do and how much to eat and how to walk. She said, I'm 21, so I feel sad. So I know you're thinking, why would she feel like I'm 21 and she's sad about turning 21? But in the modeling world, 21 is very different from 21 in the regular world because these models start out as teenagers. By the time they're in their 20s, they're considered old, which is ridiculous, but that's the way the world is. So in her mind, I guess she was starting to feel washed up at the tender age of 20, which is insane. That was her ex-boyfriend and she had a current boyfriend. Well, this current boyfriend, his name is Mark, Mark Kaminsky. And he said that he didn't see anything wrong with her. She seemed like she was happy with what she was doing, but their relationship moved very, very fast. Quote, the pair moved into Kaminsky's Staten Island house just two days after they met. Although Korshinova kept the downtown apartment she treasured. Her boyfriend, Mark said, we decided right away we were a good couple. I was in love. And now he was a luxury car exporter or luxury car tycoon. He's even been called in some of these articles. He said the last time he saw her was noon on Saturday, two hours before she leaped to her death. They had plans to go to her best friend's birthday party that night. So basically she's with her ex-boyfriend until about four or 5 a.m. She gets to her apartment around that time. Then at around noon, two hours before she fell from the building, she saw her current boyfriend, Mark, and they had plans for that evening. Well, when police started investigating her computer, they found a different story than what her friends and family were saying. Although Ruslana didn't leave a suicide note, she did leave behind a lot of posts on social media, like Facebook posts and stuff. So it says here, in January, she wrote, it hurts as if someone took a part of me, tore it out, mercilessly stomped all over and threw it out. She says, I'm a bitch. I'm a witch. I don't care what you say. This was on March 11th. I know what it is. I know why my other relationships didn't work out because I'm unpredictable. Why are you afraid of it? And she also in March wrote, my dream is to fly. Oh, my rainbow, it is too high. Now her most recent post was, do not confuse love and desire. And this was in Russian. Love is the sun, desire only flash. Desire dazzles and the sun gives life. Love does not take away from one in order to give to another. I'm so lost. Will I ever find myself? Once investigators found those posts and saw the pills and the fact that her apartment was locked, it didn't seem like someone had barged in, they tested DNA under her nails, there was no DNA, and they just kind of came to the conclusion, it looks like she just killed herself. And so they came out and they officially said, this is a suicide. The other weird thing too was the distance that Ruslana was from the building when she landed. So it says she was eight and a half meters away from the building which is 27.8 feet. So it's a big gap from where the building ends from the ledge. So some people were like, well, this means she was pushed. Other people were like, no, maybe she ran and jumped. Then, okay, like about a year later, another model falls from a building. This model is Anastasia Drozdova, who is Ruslana's friend and they have something else in common. So there's a lot less information about Anastasia than there is about Ruslana. And I think I know why. First of all, Ruslana was more popular of a model than Anastasia. And then second of all, uh, Ruslana fell in New York. The building that Anastasia fell from was in Ukraine. She was from Ukraine, it was in Kiev. So there's a lot less coverage. And then what I did find wasn't in English. So I'm really sorry about that. I feel like I, I, if I spoke Russian or Ukrainian or something, I would have more information, but I don't. 
However, there is an author. His name is Peter Pomerantsev. Peter, okay, he wrote a book called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible. And this book made the connection between what happened to Ruslana and what happened to Anastasia. Okay, so this author spoke to a close friend of Ruslana and Anastasia. Her name was Luba. She was a model too, and she said, quote, first Ruslana, now Anastasia. I'm wondering which of my friends will be next. So Anastasia's mom is called Olga. This is what she said. She says, I got home late. She wasn't there. I found a note. Forgive me for everything. Cremate me. I ran to the police station. A cop said casually, you the mother of that girl who threw herself from the block of flats? I didn't know what to say. They showed me a bag with sneakers. They were hers. Then there could be no doubt. I searched her room for clues. I found these papers from somewhere called the Rose of the World. Strange words. Quote, Anastasia, your lullaby is winter's end. You're on your way. What could they mean? What is the Rose of the World? I know she went there with Ruslana. So it turns out that Ruslana and Anastasia had joined this group called the Rose of the World. A lot of people call it a cult, okay? And it was actually based on another more well-known uh, cult called Lifespring. Art is president of a multi-million dollar ski wear business. He says he applied the Lifespring training to his business and it prospered. And Oriana has just launched a new magazine designed to appeal to the thousands of people who graduated from groups like Lifespring. Lifespring, where the friendships and intimacies with other people like her were first developed. A place to feel you belong. I've unlearned a lot of things that society has put upon us from childhood on. Now, Lifespring actually was sued multiple times by different members saying that they cause mental damage. And the whole philosophy of Lifespring and Rose of the World is basically, they believe that you need to like break someone down in order to rebuild them again. And it's all about like accountability and like to the extreme where sometimes things happen to you that are not your fault, but and you struggle with them, but then this group is telling you that it's your fault. So it turns out that joining this group was actually kind of a trendy thing at the time with these Russian slash Eastern European models. So basically, Ruslana and Anastasia were in a point in their career where they were in their 20s. They're feeling like they're getting less calls, less deals, less bookings. And one of their friends tells them, hey, you know, there's this group in Moscow called the Rose of the World. They help people with training and wealth like you guys should join. They charge like a thousand dollars for a three day course. And both Ruslana and Anastasia had taken several courses. Anastasia that's the second one who fell in Ukraine. She was there for over a year. And Ruslana, she was there for at least three months. And so this author, Peter, he goes undercover. He writes about it in the book about taking this course. Okay, so I wanna read you some quotes from that. I acquire hidden camera and audio recordings of the training. When you enter the rose, there is darkness and shouting. Everything is designed to stun the conscious mind, suspend critical thought. Then the life trainer emerges. He talks so fast you can't help but be confused. The microphone set at a level, your head starts hurting. Quote, in the coming days you will experience discomfort fear, but this is good. This is the inner barrier you have to break through. There are 40 people in the hall who are asked to confess their worst experiences, tales of rape, abusive parents. Ruslana, I learn, was the most enthusiastic speaker. She spoke about her father's death, her failed romance, cried publicly, laughed violently, three days of shouting, recalling repressed memories, meditation followed by dancing, tears followed by ecstasy, every intense emotion you've ever had stuffed into three life-changing days. The models sign up for more training, each one a little more exciting.
expensive than the last, each one a little more intense. Friends remember that Ruslana and Anastasia thought they had finally found a place where they could be themselves, where people seemed to care about their inner turmoil, not their images on paper. Author Peter says at one point during this training session, one of the other, like, trainees mentions Ruslana and says like, you know, do you feel bad that she died and after like jumped after taking these courses? And this is what he said, quote, he said, Ruslana was a typical victim. Sometimes it's better to commit suicide than not to change. <laughs> Rude. So at this point, people are starting to think, well, maybe they did jump, but maybe they were pushed to the brink by this crazy cult that is breaking them down and putting them under all the stress and they just couldn't take it anymore. And when this author started talking to the people around Anastasia and Ruslana, they said that after taking these courses, they changed drastically. First was Anastasia. They said that Anastasia had a laugh that was quote deafening and that she would laugh so loud that when they were out in public, people would always turn around and look at them. And she was just this bubbly personality, but that all this changed after she joined the Rose of the World. In the last month before her death, she changed. She came back down to Kiev from Moscow where she had been based, refused to leave her room, sat scrunched under a duvet during a 40 degree heat wave. She would start fights and then burst into tears. She missed castings and became reclusive. And then they said that Ruslana became aggressive, which was something she was never before. Both girls were swearing a lot, cursing. They were both losing a lot of weight. The author Peter spoke to a member. This guy is called Volodya. Now he's going to come in a little bit later. He'll, he met, we'll talk about him a little bit more, but he's like a quote, true believer. And he's an assistant to the leader. And he had some interesting things to say about Ruslana and Anastasia because he was actually pretty close to them. He said, quote, Ruslana had what we would call a rollback. She felt a little strange. You'd find her wandering around town, unsure what she was doing there. Maybe she'd cry at night, but she couldn't have killed herself. We cured her of any problems she might have. And Anastasia, she was messed up already. We tried to help her. We really tried, but she refused transformation. Blame modeling, maybe drugs, not us. And then we would later find out that the day she died, she spoke to none other than Volodya. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm, I'm sure I'm saying it right. Why am I trying to pronounce the names like Volodya, like Volodya, Volodya, whatever. So remember how I told you the author Peter like went undercover and joined? Well, not only did he do that, but he had one of his employees do it as well. And this employee actually had a mental break from just being undercover, knowing that he's not part of this actual cult, but just pretending to be, caused him to have a mental break. It says here, a series of dehumanizing training sessions in which life coaches harangued and humiliated the trainees while excrecating each for their life woes. For instance, the blame for a rape was placed on a victim who was stridently accused of self-pity. The author says he experienced the surreal highs and the intense bonding that are the psychological watermarks of cult seduction. So it turns out that this Rose of the World still exists today, but they've rebranded. They're now called the Novgorodstev Education, and the guy in charge is Vladislav Novgorodstev. I'm so sorry. And he came out and spoke to the New York Daily News about his close relationship with Ruslana. He said, quote, I saw her and heard her stories, stories that no one else has heard. The most important thing about her and her internal world was that she was lonely. There was no one who was really dear to her except for her mother. She had problems for months. She had a romance in Moscow, but nothing could happen because the young man was married. She was asking for money. 10,000 rubles, which is about $400, would save her. That was 10 days before she committed suicide. They barely paid her, he said without elaboration. She wasn't rich and all the money she had, she sent to her mother. And the thing is, it's true that she was lonely and that she was basically on her own. She was discovered when she was 13. Okay. She was on her own in New York modeling in this cutthroat world, being exploited by whomever for years. 
Then she had her big break, which was the Nina Ritchie perfume ad. Nina Ritchie. This was also kind of like a blessing and a curse because according to the book, okay, this is where Jeffrey Epstein comes in. According to the book, it says that ad took Ruslana from the world of wannabes to the best parties in New York, trips to convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein's private island, to Moscow where the Russian mega rich were keen to meet the beauty from the ad, and where she fell blissfully, childishly in love with one of the handsomest tycoons in town. And this tycoon was Alexander. Now this guy was a playboy and he had dated all the models. Even her model friend was like, he dated all our friends and everybody knew he was a playboy, but Ruslana thought he was the one. She introduced him to her family. She told everyone like, we're gonna get married. We're gonna have kids. And everyone was like, dude, he's such a player. Like it's not gonna happen. But she was not listening. Then out of nowhere, he dumped her and Everyone said she had such a hard time with it. She was obsessively calling him. It got to the point where he had his assistant call Ruslana and tell her, like, stop calling. We don't want anything to do with you. And they say that's when she spiraled. So she has this relationship going to shit in Moscow. She goes back to New York. And there's even a posting she made at around the time where he broke up with her. And she writes, you left again, leaving in return, a castle of pink dreams and ruined walls. It feels as if someone tore my heart out and trod all over it. So she goes back to New York. That's where she meets the, the guy who was her current boyfriend, Mark. Remember the luxury car dealer? That is the guy who she meets. Remember, that's the one who she moves in with like after two days. So she gets from this relationship into this one. She also has her ex-boyfriend who she saw the evening before she died. So like her love life is super like messy and complicated. Even though she had those pills, the toxicology came out clean. So that's something I wanted to mention. I think I forgot to mention it earlier, but the toxicology indicated there was no heavy drug use in the months prior to her death, nor had she been drugged. The autopsy determined that she was alive when she fell and her cause of death was blunt force trauma, but still her friends and her family were refusing to believe that she did this. They also want to know if she's such a writer and she writes all these posts and poems, why didn't she leave a suicide note? They also talk about how she had these issues with money and she was talking about how she was suing someone. You know, some people believe that maybe there are people who had motives to hurt her. The author of the book feels like Ruslana jumped. He doesn't think she was pushed. He thinks she jumped. Now let's go to Ruslana's last day. It says, on the day she died, June 28th, she called a senior member of the Rose identified only as Volodya. He says that she called him an hour before her death and that she wanted to talk, but that he told her to call back later. Turns out he also had a relationship with her when they were in training and some people think that there might have been like a connection there and when he told her to call back later that she took it as rejection. When police went into her apartment and they saw, remember I told you the netting had a cut in it, when they looked in there they saw that actually even if she had jumped and went through that hole in the netting, there was another like balcony that would have stopped her from actually falling onto the floor. Turns out that was not where she fell from. It says, so she went next door to an office building under construction at the intersection of Water and Wall Street. While the police report doesn't indicate what floor she leapt from, she landed almost 28 feet from the building, a long reach. The distance suggests that Korshinova had to have started some distance back and run fast to take such an astonishingly ferocious leap to her death. Those are the facts now let's discuss the theories. So first we have the official story, right? Which is that she did this to herself. And there's a lot to suggest that, first of all, it is actually pretty common for models to kill themselves. There were a few cases that happened where like a South African model had jumped from a building. Another model took a bunch of pills. Like it's not the most 
uncommon thing because if you think about it they're they're young they're a lot of times away from their families they don't speak the language the pressure is insane they're starving they're overworked their self-worth is all messed up because of the way the industry is and so it's not hard to believe that they could be driven to this not only that but the whole idea of being washed up so young even though it's like she's 20 and just about to turn 21, the rest of the world will feel like your whole life is ahead of you. This is actually the fun is just starting. In her mind, the party's over. She could have been in this spiral where she hung out with her ex and I don't know, it seemed like he wanted to get back with her. Maybe she felt like she couldn't. Then she spoke to the other guy, Mark. Then she called Veloja. He told her to call back. Could she have felt super rejected? But some people are like, how can she feel rejected when she has all these options? They all seemed interested in her. Like, maybe someone did this to her. Maybe one of these guys that she was messing with found out about another one uh, right before her birthday. I mean, that's where the foul play theories come into play. So let's talk about that. When it comes to foul play, one of the main things that keep coming up as I was doing research is the Anastasia thing, how it's like two of them and they're in the same cult and the same industry, they're friends. Like, could there be something else connecting them? And that's when people obviously talk about the cult. Like, well, yeah, it's the cult that made them do it. It broke them down. Like, yes, maybe no one pushed them physically, but maybe they were pushed mentally. So speaking of foul play, the Russian mafia thing, right? I was reading an article in a on ABC.com, ABC News. It says, even though police ruled Korshinova's death a suicide and friends claimed she was on top of the world, blogs from Britain's Daily Telegraph to the Los Angeles Times circulated theories that the Russian mafia had killed the highly paid model because she wanted to leave the fashion industry. But the mob, which has been linked to kidnappings and shakedowns of rich Russian National Hockey League players, may be one of may be only one of the many dangers in the predatory world of young models. So the shakedown of the rich Nash Russian National Hockey League players, that's what people reference, is like, this is their MO. They go after these people, they try to exploit them, and if they don't want to play ball, well, they take you out the game essentially, is what people were saying. And then other people were talking about the ex-boyfriend, the Artem, the one who she watched the movie Ghost with, and how she was last seen with him. And people were saying that he wanted to get back together with her, but she had this other boyfriend. And so maybe he had something to do with it, but there really is no evidence of that. It's just a theory. The theory that someone physically did it, some people find it not credible, because of the Anastasia thing, because they're like, it seems more likely that they both wanted to end it. And maybe Anastasia saw what Ruslana did and kind of took after her, tried to feel better, couldn't feel better. And then saw that her friend jumped and she decided to jump too. And then that brings us back to their link, which is the cult. Did the cult drive them to do this? So I really would love to know what you guys think about this. Like, please tell me, I'm very curious. Me personally, what do I think? I think they jumped, but I think they were mentally pushed to the brink by this cult. So I, I do a lot of things about cults and the, the mind, the mind fuckery that occurs with cults is another level. The control they have on you, another level. The things they could get you to do, I mean, my gosh. So anyway, tell me what you guys think. And thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Please check out the link in the description if you want to get these fragrances for a good deal. Thank you so much. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.